Hello, hello. Welcome back to Mistress of the Damned. I am your Mistress Katrina. If you are new here, welcome. Glad to see you here. How are you doing? This is where I am reading through my enormous library books and telling you the story and then telling you what I think about the story. So if you like books, are not quite sure what to read, if you just like to hear random people ramble on the internet, hit that subscribe button. Like and share my videos. Let me know what you think in the comments. This week's book, uh, well, let me back up. Last month, or maybe it was two months ago, I decided I needed to know more about the presidents of the United States. There is not a whole lot taught about them. I think I could maybe, I could maybe name half of them if I had to push, uh, but ha those are including ones that were in my lifetime, and that's kind of a sad commentary on the education, educational system. I decided to remedy that, and of course you can do so by reading. So last month's book was George Washington. I'm taking them in the order in which they serve, which means this month's book on a president is John Adams, second president, first vice president. The book is written by David McCullough. Let's go get into this. Now, John Adams has long been one of my favorite founding fathers. I think he was a man of incredible integrity. Uh, he very firmly believed in freedom for all. He never owned slaves. He thought slavery was an abomination, and he thought that it was a blatant hypocrisy to allow slavery in a country that fought for freedom for all, right? So how can it be for all if people who are living here are slaves? And he thought that was very wrong, and, and he did advocate against that, uh, was voted down, but that's you know part of the story. Now, he was born October 30th in 1735 in Braintree, Massachusetts, which is just outside of Boston. And he was really smart. He was really smart as a kid, was an avid reader throughout his entire life. He, he collected books, much like I do, probably why part of the reason I'm so very drawn to him as a founding father is I feel this, this kinship with the books and the reading. He, he was not alone in that. Je Jefferson was also quite an avid reader, and between the two of them, they founded, John Adams founded the Library of Congress, and Jefferson made sure it survived after the library burned. I think that was part of 1812. Now, part of his studies, and he was, he was a much loved child, so he went to school when the school he was attending to, attending did not meet his needs and he felt like he was being held back. He told his father this, and his father got him into a different school, and he resumed his studies studied hard, was admitted into Harvard at 15, which sounds impressive, was a little more normal back in 17, in the 17, what the, the 50, 1750, if he was 15 when he was admitted. He enrolled at Harvard at 15, graduated at 19, spent several years working as a teacher because he wanted to be a lawyer, and that was his ultimate goal was to be a lawyer, and they didn't have law schools such as they are today. Uh, when you wanted to be a lawyer back in the 18th century, you would pay a fee to an attorney and then work as his clerk while studying with him and then after X period of time when you felt you had enough knowledge you would go and take the bar exam. Which he did. He, he studied diligently and passed the bar November 1759 when he was 24 years old. And then immediately set up practice which did not end well for him. Well okay, the law practice ended well for him his first case he lost so it was kind of an inauspicious start. But he kept going on and did very well for himself. He met his wife, uh, or future wife, Abigail in 1759, but they did not marry right away. He wanted to be established and able to support a family before he got married. And so they courted for uh, five years. So she was 15 when they met. And he was 24. This was not unusual. Okay, I know it sounds modern day ultra creepy, right? Oh my god, he was nine years older than her. That was quite common in the 18th century. And there was nothing untoward about it. And they, they courted until she was 20 and then they married. October 25th, 1764 was when they married. Now, I know last, last month when I was talking about Washington, uh, and we talked about Washington marrying Martha Custis, and a lot of that was a marriage for property and convenience, and that was the more usual way of things to, to marry to combine estates and grow wealth in that fashion. John and Aunt Abigail were very much in love. They, they were in love not quite from the moment that they met, but not too long after that. He became infatuated with her, and they, they fell in love, and they remained in love throughout their entire lives and until death did them part, and I'm pretty sure he loved her even after she died, and she did predecease him. 
They had five children, Abigail, uh, who they called Nabby, uh, John Quincy, John Quincy Adams, Susanna, Charles, and Thomas. Susanna died when she was two, and that was very devastating to the family. I mean, it's not, was not unheard of. I mean, childhood mortality was still relatively high in the 18th century, but no less devastating for the loss. Adam's career in Boston was very good. He was a successful lawyer. He was able to support his family. He was semi-active in, in uh, politics. He wrote dissertations on laws that were passed and that affected the entire colonies. He wrote the Massachusetts Constitution, uh, which is the oldest standing constitution in the world, incidentally. It, it's still, I, I think I read somewhere that it was the framework upon which the U.S. Constitution is written. And he was very passionate about freedom and belief in freedom and equality for all. And all of that came through in all of his writing, but he also believed in justice, which was put to the test, right, in uh, 1770 when we had the Boston Massacre. And this was a big deal. I mean, no, no less a big deal than modern day politics with police shootings and everything else. It was huge. And he stepped up and did the incredibly unpopular task of defending the soldiers, which he did successfully. They were all all but two of them were found not guilty. The two that were found guilty were found guilty of manslaughter. So instead of being executed, they were branded, I think it was on the thumb with an M for manslaughter. And, and that's a remarkable feat because Boston was one of the hotbeds of politics and freedom at that time. And they were very much re re the, the among the first colonies to actively rebel against Great Britain. So his successful defense of soldiers in a territory that hot was an incredible feat of lawyering, if you will. The, the famous line he said is, facts are funny things. And then he laid out that essentially the, the soldiers were mobbed and they have a right to defend themselves. And that is what they did. And I know there's a lot there. I've seen memes where people are like, oh, lawyers who defend bad cops are bootlickers and they'd be like John Adams. Well, hold that thought because John Adams was a principled man. And I don't know that it's necessarily a bad thing to be compared to John Adams, okay? His defense of the soldiers did impact his practice. It's not like everyone, oh, well, I guess you're right. They have a right to defend themselves. It impacted his practice, and he experienced a bit of a slump, which slowly was coming out of it when he was assigned to the Continental Congress in Philadelphia in 1774, where he argued passionately for independence. Uh, uh, to the point, I mean, he... he when it became clear that war was going to happen, or at least that this is definitely the way the colonies were going, he argued so passionately that he got the people who were against it to stop talking. And that was as good as a win. Getting them to just stop talking was as good as a win. He's the one who de decided and then adamantly defended that George Washington should be the leader of the armies. And when they said, okay, we need a declaration, he said, put Jefferson in charge of writing it. And then once Jefferson wrote it, he defended it again so passionately that it passed which was amazing okay uh interesting historical fact or historical aside i guess is it didn't actually get signed on july 4th it got signed on july 2nd uh, at least that was when it started being signed i think the last signatures were signed were, were put to it in august but regardless july 4th isn't actually independence day who knew you know apparently nobody else not even the founding fathers because nobody said a word about it but <laughs> He was very passionate about that, and he believed in freedom. And the argument could definitely be made that he was the voice of independence, and that if he had not spoken the way he did, if he had not been assigned to Congress, the revolution might not have happened. And I think that Britain certainly believed that at one point. Uh, not too long after war was declared, th there was a delegation sent to meet with Admiral Howe, and Adams, Benjamin Franklin, and Eldridge, uh, uh, Rutledge, Edward Rutledge, excuse me, were the three who went and met with Admiral Howe, and Adams made a really strong impression on Howe, and he, he made some, you know, pithy comment about, you know, war and when, when it would be over and, and everybody being friends, and Howe kind of looked at him sadly, and Adams didn't get it at first, but he found out later that there, Howe already had in his hand a list of the rebels who were to be granted pardons, and Adams was not one of them. If, if they had lost the war, Adams would have been hanged as a traitor. Franklin made the comment, you know, we all must hang together or we'll surely hang separate. Well, Adams would have hung for sure. 
he was on the list of people that they knew was a troublemaker and would keep fighting for freedom. So politically, he was so active. I, I, I mean, Washington fought on the front lines with the men and Adams fought for him behind the scenes. Uh, truly, th these were the shoulders of great men. Adams, almost as soon as they got the war off the ground and he got money or he got, um, he was assigned to the war board and making sure that the soldiers were out there. He was then sent to France as an envoy. He was, uh, while in France, he realized that they were not going to be getting money from the French and the United States needed money badly to fight this war. So he, on his own uh, volition or own, what's sort of looking for? He went to the Netherlands on his own. He, he determined that this is where the banking was. This was where, where capitalism was rising. And so he went to the Netherlands entirely on his own uh, merit. That's the one I'm looking for. He went on his own merit and secured loans for the United States so that they could keep fighting. Uh, he did it successfully multiple times. And when he got through in the Netherlands, he was went back to France. Uh, he spent like a year back in the States after negotiating the treaty that ended the war in Paris, or he negotiated in Paris the treaty that ended the war. There we go. And then he went back to the States where he was very briefly, I think for maybe a year before he returned with his wife and daughter Nabby and John Quincy. I think John Quincy may have been left behind to study, but I, I might be getting, you know what? I'll find out about that when I read about John Quincy. Uh, he served as president. I've got a book about him. But Nabby and Abigail joined him. They were in France. They again went to the Netherlands, and then they were signed to England. Uh, in England, he was treated quite graciously by the king. I mean, it's not like they were golf buddies or anything like that, but they were not hostile to each other. The king treated him as he would any other ambassador, which is no less than you would expect from royalty, right? You expect them to have cooler heads. The rest of England fucking hated him. I mean, I don't think they ever actually spat on him when he was walking down the street, but they were openly hostile. While stationed overseas, uh, Thomas Jefferson was there, and he, that's when he and Jefferson formed a really strong friendship. Abigail, too, was friends with Jefferson for a while. That, that ended up breaking later as part of politics, because Abigail, bless her heart, she stood by her man, and Adam's couldn't bring himself to quite break with Jefferson, so Abigail was like, well, I'm out. I'm not having anything more to do with this guy. Um, interesting fact, while they were stationed in England, uh, Jefferson had his youngest daughter, Polly, join him in France, and she stopped in England for a while, and, and while she was in England, she stayed with the Adamses, and the nursemaid who went with her was one Sally Hemings. Hmm. Sally Hemings was 14 at the time. I believe Jefferson was like 39 or 41. I mean, there was a significant age gap, which, yeah, I'm looking forward to learning more about that. But anybody who knows anything about Jefferson and history and any of the scandals knows who Sally Hemings is. And it definitely comes back and haunts him. Even back then, it came back and haunted him. When he was recalled from England after having served his time as an ambassador there, he returned to the U.S. in 1788, which was just in time for the very first presidential election. Now, in the 18th century, the person who garnished the most electoral college votes won the presidency, and the person with the second most votes became the vice president. So Washington became president, John Adams was voted his vice president, and he sat in the Senate. I mean, he, like every other job John Adams ever undertook, he was very diligent. He sat in on every single meeting of the Senate for all eight years that he was the vice president. I think he cast a total of 29 tie-breaking votes. I, I know that sounds weird that they actually had a tie in the Senate. I don't think we've had a tie in the Senate in a very long time um, because of party politics. But back then there were 13 colonies, so there were only 26 senators a lot easier to get a tie when it's 26, right? So you have 13 on each side. John Adams cast that vote. He consistently voted in favor of protecting the executive branch and a strong central government and voting in whatever way would support George Washington. He was, he was 
the man to have at your back politically. Which was interesting because nobody ever had his back politically. Uh, when you're reading this book, and this is really interesting, uh, David McCullough wrote out some of the behind-the-scenes politicking that took place, and Jefferson comes across as uh, kind of a vapid hypocrite, and Hamilton, whew, David McCullough did not have much good to say about Alexander Hamilton. I, I'm not sure if he even likes Hamilton. I don't like Hamilton after reading this book. I mean, Hamilton just comes across as a political fucktard. I just a vile creature who manipulated everybody to his own end, um, but failed in the end largely because Adams managed to outmaneuver him. Hamilton wanted uh, uh, to be the head of a standing army, and he damn near got his wish when Adams was voted president in the 1796. Okay, and Washington decided he didn't want to run a third time, so Hamilton swung his political electioneering, got Adams voted in because his alternative was to have Jefferson, and Hamilton didn't want that. He wanted a strong Federalist Party, and for better or for worse, as early as Adams, the party system was implementing, and Adams would have been a Federalist. And so he backed Adams, got Adams elected, with Jefferson voted in as his vice president, and Napoleon happened. They had the, the French Revolution occurred, and Adams was horrified by the French Revolution. He, he saw how bloody and despotic that was going to be. Hamilton saw it as a chance to get a strong standing army, and they, they pushed the narrative that the French were going to come over here and start attacking us. The only place the French ever attacked were some ships in the Caribbean, but Adams already had started building a strong navy, and they were able to fight back. And well, kick some butt, basically. But Hamilton wanted an army. He wanted to be the head of the army. Adams actually put Washington in charge, and Washington, uh, basically everybody knew that that was just a position in title only. Washington might be the brains, but he was retired, and there was no way he was going back in the field. So Washington put Hamilton in charge, which Adams didn't want. Adams and Abigail sort of saw Hamilton as a miniature Napoleon, somebody who wanted to take over the continent with a standing army. And so once Hamilton was in charge of the armies, such as they were, Adams had to outmaneuver him, which he did by getting a treaty signed with France. So he managed to push a peace treaty with France, which cut the legs out from underneath Hamilton. And it infuriated Hamilton to the point that when the 1800 elections came around, and Adams was already positive he was not going to win a second election, or second term. He, he was sure of it. Well before the election ever took place, he knew he was going to be a one-term president, and he was fine with that. And he knew he would be because uh, every day was a battle for him. Every day, because he wanted to be a president above politics, and so both the Federalists, who were nominally his party, and the... Republicans, which were the, the opposing party run by Jefferson at the time, uh, hated him. They hated him as president. They hated that he was putting himself uh, above party politics. There was a lot of mm, electioneering, a lot of slander, a lot of, well, I can't say slander. He, his presidency wasn't all sunshine and peaches. He did pa uh, sign off on the Alien and Sedition Acts, and those were grossly unpopular for a variety of reasons. I have a feeling David McCullough is a huge fan of John Adams also because he didn't go too strongly into the Alien and Sedition Acts. The, the Alien Act essentially made it so that instead of becoming a U.S. citizen in five years, it took you 14. The Sedition Act made it illegal, essentially, to say anything bad about elected officials in gross violation of the First Amendment, and that one was used quite heavily, it, 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 which was problematic, right? Anyways, Hamilton, eventually, following the treaty with France, posted a letter to the press that just blasted Adams, and it killed Hamilton's own career, and it left Jefferson a guaranteed winner. Now, well, okay, almost a guaranteed winner. When the electoral votes were counted, Jefferson and Aaron Burr were tied at 73 votes each. When a tie happens, it goes to Congress. It goes to the House of Representatives to then break the tie which they decided, determined in favor of Jefferson with Aaron Burr as vice president. And that was our party essentially for the next eight years with Jefferson as the president and Aaron Burr as the vice president. And at that point, Adams retired, effectively retired. He, the day of Jefferson's inauguration, he left quietly on the 4 a.m. stagecoach. 
I know there's some people who think that he slunk home because he didn't win. No, he left at 4 a.m. because that's when the stagecoach home left. And that's if he wanted to be home, that's what he had to do. So he took the 4 a.m. coach and beat feet. With leaving the political arena as the second president of the United States, he just settled in. He was enjoying time with his family and friends, renewing written correspondence with old friends. He received hundreds of correspondences, and he re replied to all. He read books, and he enjoyed his time as a farmer. Approximately four years after Jefferson retired, so Jefferson was in charge, 1801 to 1808, and then he retired in 1812. Jefferson and Adams renewed their correspondence. Adams sent Jefferson a letter, and they stayed on good terms. They, they, I don't believe they ever saw each other again, but they remained in correspondence with each other until they both died. Now, Adams had some sadness in his family. His son Charles in 1800 died of alcoholism, which this seems like it's something, believe it or not, that it was inherited from Abigail's side. Abigail's brother had died of alcoholism. Uh, Charles became an alcoholic and eventually died, and their son Thomas also became an alcoholic, although he did outlive Adams. In 1816, his daughter Nabby died of breast cancer, and then in October 1818, Abigail died, and Adams was just left alone. I mean, not alone, alone. He still had his other family, extended friends. People came by all the time to visit with him, and he kept up his correspondence. Basically, just enjoyed being the grandfather of nations until he died on July 4th, 1826. They both did. Jefferson and Adams both died July 4th, 1826, which was at the time seen as a sign of divine providence because the, the two men who, who launched the revolution, Jefferson who wrote the Declaration of Independence and Adams who defended it, both died on the same day, just hours apart. 50 years after it was signed. It was, uh, he was just such a remarkable human being. He believed in freedom. He believed in equality. When uh, Haiti experienced a slave revolution, Toussaint, I'm pulling that name out of thin air here. I unfortunately don't remember his first name, but, but he was the leader of the slave rebellion. He reached out and sent an envoy to Adams and the envoy was received and became the first black emissary to sit down with a sitting president and have a meal. And that was huge. He believed in that. He believed that all men were created equal. And he remained an advocate of that until he died. It was a 650 page book. It was a detailed story of John Adams' life. And my synopsis just does not do it justice. Adams was ideologically consistent. He believed there was nothing so abhorrent as slavery and never in his life owned a slave. When his family was located overseas on diplomatic, diplomatic missions, Abigail left the care of their house in the hands of a free black woman. They, Abigail and John both championed rights of everyone, decried slavery as a blatant hypocrisy in a country whose founding principle was freedom. Uh, that hypocrisy was among the wedges that Abigail could not forgive Jefferson for, uh, along with political skullduggery. There, there was a letter that Jefferson wrote that was published that was not favorable to Adams and she didn't she couldn't forgive him for that and she, she blamed Jefferson for some things that Hamilton was in charge of or responsible for and, and that did sully their friendship but I think the final nail was Sally Hemings because she remembered Sally from when they were in England together and one of the people who had been jailed as part of the Sedition Act for criticizing Adams got out and essentially tried to blackmail Jefferson for it, saying, you know, saying, hey, I, I dove on this grenade for you. You should really pay me. And Jefferson gave him like 50 bucks. And the guy was insulted and immediately opened his own press and started printing stuff about Jefferson. And among the things he printed about Jefferson was Sally Hemings. So that story was, in fact, known in the 18th century. And it just came back to haunt him. Still haunts him man's been dead 300 years and it still haunts him. The, the odd question floats around, like if you could have a conversation with anybody dead or alive, who would it be? And for me, John Adams is somebody I would so wish that I could have met. That's it for this week. 
Uh, thank you for watching. Don't forget to like the video, hit that subscribe button, share it. I'll see you next week when I review American Nations by Colin Woodard. Bye.